Episode 7 of the Torque Factor Podcast is here, and I'm your host, Scott Brown. This is the place where we discuss all things moving the automotive service industry forward, focusing on expanding knowledge and awareness around tools, equipment, education, and industry trends. This episode's featured guest is Michael Invardson, who is the Global Technical Training Manager for Nissan's Automotive. He's a subject matter expert on mobile air conditioning and climate control systems. Now, I heard Michael speak at the 2020 MAX convention earlier this year in Nashville, Tennessee, and knew that I needed to get him on the program. A lot of change has occurred over the past decade or so in regards to mobile air conditioning systems along with diagnostic strategies, and Michael has a lot of insight to share with us. And we also have Donnie Seifer, the Executive Officer for the National Automotive Service Task Force, or NASDAF, where he brings us up to speed with a recap of the first ever NASDAF Spring General Meeting held virtually and updates us on what's happening with security and programming access. VehicleServicePros.com is a trusted online resource for vehicle service and repair information, fleet maintenance management, and the latest products for servicing America's fleet of vehicles. It is the official website of Professional Tool and Equipment News, Fleet Maintenance, and Professional Distributor Magazines. VehicleServicePros.com is on the pulse of the industry, sharing new technology, the latest product information, and market trends to keep our readers in the know-how. And that brings us to our recall segment. First recall we have is from Ford Motor Company, who is recalling 55,000 2020 Rangers, F-150s, and Expeditions equipped with the police package. All of these vehicles had the 10-speed automatic transmission, and the transmission shift cable has a lock clip that may not have been fully seated during assembly. This will allow the transmission to actually be in a different gear than the gear shift position selected by the driver. Our next recall is from General Motors, and it's number 19 V as in Victor-814. They are recalling over 550,000 2019 to 2020 Silverados. These vehicles have a pre-tensioner attached to the seat belts that ignite during a collision. These pretensioners potentially could create a fire under the seats if a pretensioner becomes activated. And it's always a great idea to run the VIN numbers on vehicles passing through your service center through the NHTSA website so you can keep your customers in the know how. And that brings us to our case study segment. Again, we're pulling up a case study from Diagnostic Network titled Attention to Details, uh, posted by Matthew Potter from Elmsdale Automotive in Nova Scotia. So he writes about this 2010 Dodge Ram with the 5.7 liter engine that came into his shop uh, with numerous complaints, Uh, had a P0882 TCM power supply signal input low, had a U0102 lost communications with the transfer case control module, a P0760, shift solenoid C circuit open, and uh, some other uh, strange problems. So he, um, he assumed that it was probably uh, as a result of the uh, engine that was re- recently replaced in the vehicle, and uh, possibly the, the harness or something got damaged or what have you. So he began a pragmatic approach uh, by starting to look at the DTCs, which are clues into uh, you know, what's going on. So he started doing some circuit checks and um, you know, ran through numerous things. I could tell he spent a lot of time uh, on this vehicle. And if you're looking at the web uh, version of this uh, podcast, uh, you'll see also the associated uh, uh, images that he provided. But um, this vehicle, actually what happened was that it had a, uh, an engine from a 2011 Dodge Ram. That was a donor vehicle. Uh, put into this 2010, and he found that the wiring harness attached to the engine, it was used, uh, the the one that came from the 2011. Everything plugged directly in, but just because it plugs in doesn't mean that the pins haven't been reconfigured. And so he did find uh, that he had a couple of pins that were in different locations from one year to the other. So, you know, when you're Faced with a problem like this, um, it's good to do some investigative 
uh, research, uh, background research, before you end up burning up uh, too much time, um, you know, trying to solve a problem. All right, that brings us to our featured guest interview with Michael Edvardsen with Nissan's Automotive. And as I mentioned earlier, I met Michael at the 2020 MAX convention in Nashville, Tennessee earlier this year. And uh, I heard him speak and I thought, wow, this guy really knows what he's talking about. I need to get him on the show. Uh, Since that time, uh, we've stayed in touch, but I did get a chance to attend three classes that he offered through the WorldPAC Technical Institute, uh, their online training, and three awesome events. So you should go to the WorldPAC Technical Institute and uh, sign up and check those out. You can get access to those for free as of today. So let's have a listen. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special guest on the call today. We have Michael Invardsen from Nissan's Automotive, all the way from Denmark. And uh, Michael is a gentleman that I met at MAX 2020. That's the Mobile Air Conditioning Society uh, annual conference in Nashville, Tennessee. And I heard him give an uh, awesome presentation. And since then, uh, we've been in communication and he recently delivered three outstanding training sessions for WorldPAC uh, through uh, their mobile or their remote uh, training delivery. So welcome to the call, Michael. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Well, thank thank you again for taking time out of your day to, to do this. So, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, um, and by the way, you are a subject matter expert in mobile air conditioning. Is that correct? <laughs> True, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I've done it since I was 16 years old, so I guess I'm, I'm considered an expert, but there's still things I don't know, but yeah, I'm yeah. considered an expert, so yeah. Great. No, I, I really appreciated everything that you shared in the class, uh, or the classes that you did, and... Um, sure. You know, one of the things that uh, intrigued me and things that we look at closer here in my shop um, is the refrigeration oil uh, in the system. And, you know, in the past, years ago, you used to have a sight glass, and you can kind of see a little bit about what's going on in there, but you really can't get an assessment of how much actual oil is in the system. And, you know, we we know that oil plays a couple of important roles. And so what I want to do, maybe get you to touch on a little bit more about this visual tool that you demonstrated um, in the in sure. the class on how technicians can take advantage of this this uh, this visual indicator uh, to help them do a better job. Yeah, sure, not a problem at all. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of funny because it's it's a fairly old tool that was developed back in uh, actually Berlin, Eastern Europe, uh, or Eastern Germany. Uh, back about 15, 20 years ago, uh, it was a Eastern European or Eastern German guy that came up with it, that came up with a very simple solution, actually creating a sight glass that's much, much bigger than the ones that we normally know. And he simply connected a low-pressure and high-pressure hose and a low-pressure connector and a, a high-pressure connector. And what he did was that he simply just connected uh, the low-pressure side uh, with the high-pressure side with the side glass in between. It's a fairly big side glass. I mean, most people know the side glasses as the ones that we see on uh, HVAC commercial units, but this one is probably 20 times bigger. So you can actually get a very good visual um, look at what's inside the system. Uh, it's not going to cause any problems to the system simply because you're just you're basically just interacting, taking a little bit of refrigerant passing through from the low or from the high side to the low side. So it's not going to cause any any issues whatsoever. And for for those of you who think that 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 there will be liquid in this visual diagnostic tool, but the liquid that's in there that goes on the low side will actually evaporate before it goes into the comp- compressor. So you're not going to have a liquid hammer or anything else like that or liquid going in between the pistons. So so what's really nice about this is that uh Back in the days where we had the R12 with the side glasses on the uh, on the dryer, where we could slightly see whether there was liquid in it or not, this one is much much bigger. So now you get a very good look at uh, how much, not how much, but how how uh, powerful the UV dye is, how much uh, oil or is it actually miscible? Uh, can we see that the oil actually does mix mix with the refrigerant? And we can also see if, uh, basically if there's no refrigerant in the system at all. Um, so, so this tool is is a great tool to to actually find out whether the system is run the way it should. Also, to see the color 
uh, or discoloration of the oil. So let's say that you're having a visual diversity oil connected to the vehicle and the oil is slightly slightly brown or black or whatever, then you actually know that the system's overheated over time. It might be that it's still working, but you do know that if you have black oil in the system, you know that you're going to have to clean it and add new oil. Otherwise, this compressor or this system will uh, malfunction very, very soon. So uh, so it, it's a great tool. It's very uh, inaffordable, actually. Um, and everybody, basically, in my world, anybody should have it. And uh, yeah, it, it's a perfect tool to actually uh, diagnose the system and how the oil is running and how it, it, it should be running, to be honest. Yeah, so I, I, I find that uh, anytime you can uh, get access to a, a new piece of equipment that provides you with another indicator of system health uh, certainly is, is beneficial. And I can tell you that we, we recently had a car in here. It was a Hyundai. Um, this is a few months ago, and the uh, system wasn't performing performing properly, pressures were not correct. Uh, it was a variable displacement compressor. Um, we could not get the, any any cycling change out of it when we connected a special tool, you know, to o- operate the uh, the oil control valve. And so we condemned the compressor and, uh, you know, went, went in and did, did the service work. But I disassembled the compressor. One, I found it had hardly any oil in it. And two, the the pivoting mechanism for the swash plate was actually bound up. And I found, you know, it, it had an extreme amount of wear and it actually had burrs on it. And that's what was causing it to lock up. So the oil control could not move that plate at all. But I, I would attribute that entirely due to the fact that it was low on oil and uh, the lubrication, which plays a, an important role, uh, led to that early death. So, you know, when you've got a an indicator like that and you, you pull, you're doing a performance test, usually it's in the shop because of a complaint. Um, and you can pull that out and you see maybe dark oil or no evidence of oil, um, and it's not performing properly, um, maybe you can flush it out and add some oil and get it working again. But that's good inf- information to share with the client to tell them, hey, by the way, this thing was very low on oil. There may be a future problem, correct? You're yeah, exactly right. I mean, I think the visual part of it is very, very important because now nowadays you're having customers who wants to know what you're actually doing to the vehicle and before you charge them 500 pounds or I'm sorry 500 dollars or whatever you're charging them they really want to know that what are you doing and am I sure that doing you're doing the right kind of job and and with the visual dark control you're actually able to show them say listen I mean you got brown or black oil and, and this is and actually have a sample right next right next to the the side glass saying listen I mean this is the way uh, normal AC oil should look like this is what yours look like do you want me to do anything or just, just want to just keep keep driving like this? And most people say, well, I mean, I would want to change that and fix it. They go, okay, that's fine. They will will do it. The problem is once you just go out to your customer and say, listen, I mean, uh, you have to change the oil, you have to do everything else. It's like $500 and that's fine. They go, no, I don't think so. I think you're going to have to show me and tell me how this works. And, and that's, that's actually where this tool comes in. And it takes... The, the, the beauty of it is that it only takes about a minute actually for you to connect it and show it to your customer. Uh, and it, it's it's not big science. It really isn't. It's just a visual tool that would actually make it very, very clear to the customer and you how this is working. The only downside uh, to this tool, but the, but but that will always be with any tool that, that tries to detect the oil uh, or what kind of oil is in there, they will always have this, is that you're not able to, to tell the quality of the oil. That That's the only downside, but that's just the way things work. So, uh, because that, that, that will lead us on to what kind of oil should we be using? What kind of oil is in the system? Have you been chopping up this car for the past 10 years? So does that mean that the original oil, now it's basically just a mix of all kinds of oil? That that's the only downside, but that that downside will always be there, no matter what tools you're gonna you're gonna buy in the market. So uh, so yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, by the way, I did look at the Nissan's uh, website, and I did find that there was a visual chart on the uh, on the website that gives you an indicator of all the different stages or different levels and things to look for. So that's uh, that's great information, and I'll have all those notes in the or I'll have that, that those links in the show notes here, uh, so that our users can. Uh, you know, click through and uh, look at that further. 
Um, so great. So thank you. That's great discussion on on the refrigerant. Uh, also, you know, I will um, illustrate. Also, in there, we do have a uh, YouTube version of this uh, podcast, and I'll have some visual indicators there too. But I have found that you know, of course, you want to have the low side at the top, you know, uh, and while you're taking in a, a load of uh, refrigerant, but uh, and you've got ball valves on either side of this thing, and so when you shut off the uh, the high side, and you start to creep open the the low side, you can actually see the refrigerant. You know, when it's fully charged and you've got uh, a load of liquid in there, you can actually see it boil and and see it basically convert and then pull it back in. And then at the end, I also try to look. You can see the oil film on the glass as well. So it's a it's an awesome uh, awesome tool. So thank you for that info. So the other thing that I wanted to look at um, was uh, the fact that you know in, in commercial air conditioning, and I uh, probably about five years ago, I had a new air conditioning system uh, installed at my residence. And while the gentleman was there doing, uh, they actually sent out a uh, uh, there was a, an inspection company that came out afterwards uh, to do it because it, it had to meet some sort, some level of uh, proficiency or, or efficiency. And so they came out to do an assessment. And when they connected their manifold gauges, they also connected uh, a number of thermal couples to monitor uh, the, pre- the temperatures at various points of the system. And um, since that time, you know, I've been investigating and I've come across another product that's out there in the marketplace, and that's that um, it's Ritchie Engineering has this man-tooth device, and it's a manifold gauge assembly that um, is actually a wireless, um, and it communicates with your uh, you know mobile device, but it's also doing temperature measurements and giving you the thermodynamic uh, data. So what uh, what can you tell me about that uh, that level? of information and how useful it is. Well, we, we have to remember that AC systems back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and even 2000 were, were fairly straightforward. We had a fixed displacement compressor who, which worked or didn't work. I mean, it was fairly simple. Either it was on or it wasn't on. Uh, we had fairly big condensers. We had, I'm sorry, that's not right. We had a, a very big condensers with humongous tubes, where it's very difficult to get some, something gets stuck in there. So we rarely saw a system where it wasn't, where it was difficult not to do a diagnosis based on pressure. So basically, you could read your low pressure, you could read your high pressure, and then you would actually be able to very easily find out what was wrong with the system. That all changed back in 2000, or actually 1996, when the first MCB back compressors came out of the market, the Volkswagen introduced them, Mercedes did. Uh, and in 2003, where we got the electronic control compressors, we were really having some issues uh, diagnosing the systems just by reading the pressure because um, anybody who's, who's, well, everybody who's worked on air conditioning, air conditioning systems today has seen that the low pressures are constant. It's always too fast so we control the temperature in the evaporator. That means that back in the days where we could read that, I'm sorry, I'm saying too far, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 we're looking at 20 to 25 PSI. I have to apologize that. I'm still on European uh, reading, so <laughs> yeah, one bar is one atmosphere, so that that should be you know yeah, for, yeah. for our audience, they should understand the the, the metric measurement. So yeah. go ahead, continue, please. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll try and convert it into PSI, but but anyway, I mean you, you you're still looking at a constant uh, to control the temperature and the evaporator. Um, when you have that, that means that you cannot really use the low pressure anymore to see if there's any kind of blockage in the system. You also see a higher pressure now that. Base it varies from uh, basically 90 to 100 psi, up to 150, up to 200 psi, depending on the uh, the fan, the condenser fan going on and off. So basically, you, you're not seeing pressures that best, that could seem to be okay, but but unfortunately, when we're talking about air conditioning systems, we're talking about thermodynamics, meaning that low temperature, high temperature, we're talking about uh, basically heat transfer. Uh, we want heat transfer in the system, meaning going from low, uh, warm to cold, warm to cold, or cold to warm, cold to warm. So basically, if, if you're just using your low pressure to, to, to check your readings or, or check your diagnosis, you, you will fail 
dramatically when you have a system that's not work that's not fully working. It also depends on the way that you actually uh, put your low pressure uh, connector service port and high pressure. We we do see a lot of uh, low service connectors. Oh, I'm sorry, high service connectors after the condenser. Uh, that means that uh, if there's a small blockage in the parallel flow uh, microtube condenser, and if the audience is not aware of what that kind of condenser that is, that's the kind of condenser where the tube is the size of a hair. I mean, it, it is that small. So it's very easy for some uh, some small part to get stuck in there. Once that gets stuck, your pressure will go up. That also means that the temperature will go up. But unfortunately, the pressure goes backwards, okay? So if you have a high-pressure connector right after the condenser, you, you're not going to see that high pressure because it goes backward back to the compressor. So now you have to know what kind of what kind of chamber is in the compressor, what kind of temperature is actually in the inlet and outlet of the condenser, what's the temperature of the evaporator, what's the temperature of the expansion valve, dryer, and so, so on and so on. So basically, uh, if, if you really want a well-read uh, or well-diagnosed system just for pressure, we're looking at, at potentially having four to five different low-pressure connectors and actually five to six different high-pressure connectors. No manufacturer is going to do that. I mean, that, that's just a waste of space and waste of time. So so what Rich Engineering and a lot of other companies did was that they said, well, let's go back to basic. Let's go back to HVAC commercials or commercial refrigeration where we basically rely on heat transfer or rely on temperature diagnostics because we know if the temperatures are right, the system should be working, okay? Because we can make so many different temperature readings in the systems that it, it weigh, that it outweighs the, the low pressure and high pressure connector that we, that we have today. So today you have to, to rely on temperature readings more than pressure, low pressure and high pressure reading. It doesn't mean it should be without the low pressure and high pressure, but it should be a guidance and also uh, use the rich engineering tool, the main tool, to actually check the inlet and outlet condenser and everywhere else where you can get access to a temperature where you can see, okay, is this right or is this wrong? So that's why all these tools, all of a sudden, is becoming much more interesting for the automotive industry uh, than it was back basically 10 years ago. Uh, but we're seeing it now also because it is very difficult to diagnose. And when we do connect our diagnostic tool um, and go to the OBD and, and check the CAN bus, we get a reading saying, oh, by the way, this is this is not working. But why isn't it working? I mean, it's nice to change a component, but it's even nicer to change a component you know that's not functioning correctly. Or is it because we need to understand that once a diagnostic tool gets a reading, it simply just gives you a feedback saying, yep, this this compression is not working. But why isn't it working? And what caused it not to work? That's what we had to find out before we start replacing these parts. And that's why temperature readings are so important these days. Yes, uh, yeah. These these vehicles are very complex, and I have found some cases where yep. um, the the high side, like you said, the high side pressure uh, port is after the condenser. Uh, but sometimes yep. these cars, you you might want to take your scan tool and take a look. There may be a high side pressure indicator that's actually being sampled from the discharge line, and so there you can yep. actually do between the two, you can do your differential uh, analysis. And like you said, these condensers have very very fo- fine uh, pass passages that can easily be plugged and cause a restriction. True. That is that is after true. And I, I think I, I have not done a physical training class. Uh, well, I haven't done one for quite a while, but, <laughs> but that's a different story. But, but, uh, but, but I haven't done a physical training class where I show these tubes. So we have three different kinds of parallel flow microtube uh, uh, samples with me, and people are really as- astonished of how small they are. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're really talking micro macro, uh, and we are really talking about the size of a hair. So, and, and it, it, the good thing is that we, we give these samples away for free simply because it's great as a workshop to have it in your workshop when a customer doesn't understand what it means when you have black oil or residue or particles in the system, showing them saying, listen, this is what your condenser looks like. I mean, if we don't flush the system or clean it or whatever, it'll get stuck in here, the pressure will go up, your compressor will break down. 
suddenly it makes it much more easy for them to understand, okay, I do need to replace the condenser. I do need more more cow because this system is so much more delicate than the one that was on my Buick or Volvo or whatever from the 80s. Uh, and that's what, that's what people are comparing it to. It, it's back in the 80s or 90s, people went, oh, listen, my 80s didn't work perfectly. It was just great. Yeah, but it was not as efficient as the one you have today. And because of all the emission control, especially in Europe, emission control, and we want cars to drive further per gallon um, diesel or, or, or gasoline, uh, we have to make these the system is more efficient, but it also means that they become more delicate and they break down quicker if the system isn't working perfectly. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, that's that's some great insight and, and all the more reason to seek out uh, training and information so that uh, you can really sc- sharpen your uh, skills around uh, air conditioning service. So, uh, one of the, the next topic I wanted to segue into um, is one that uh, was discussed again at MAX. Um, a lot of focus, of course, on uh, electrification. So, we have a lot of electrified vehicles mm. in the marketplace, uh, not only hybrids, but battery electric. And we see some new systems coming into the into the marketplace and you I believe you gave a presentation about the heat pump system on uh, I think it was a Toyota Mar- Mariah is that correct uh, I didn't do one it was actually Toyota engineer that did one but, but I've done some in Europe uh, in, in general the most the most interesting one that we have here in Europe is actually Volkswagen they they are the predominant player when it comes to heat pump systems here in Europe Okay, and so on the heat pump system, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to go into a full-on, you know, pre- technical presentation, <laughs> but the, the heat pump system basically is uh, it's, it's satisfying the needs of creating, um, uh, removing heat and adding heat to the cabin. Is that correct? That's true. That's yeah. true. Basically, it, it, it's exactly like a heat pump system that we see at any commercial or any a uh, house in in the US Europe or whatever and and the beauty of it is that you can you can reduce the amount of components uh to a certain degree uh but what we're seeing is that you could do that but you, they're not they're actually adding complexity to, to the system um so it 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 what what the beauty of it is that you can create heat and uh, and and cool very easily by simply just uh, switching the direction of refrigerants. Um, that can be very very efficient in certain vehicles, especially hybrid and electric vehicles, where you need this AC system and the the heating system to actually heat up and cool down the batteries. So that way you're really utilizing this system. Uh, fully, um, on the systems that we are seeing today, uh, that we've seen, uh, that, that's probably something that we haven't seen, but that, but, but the ones you've seen, they are complex. And, and let me just tell you, if, if you think it's difficult to diagnose a, 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 a ACV valve, parallel flow, uh, condenser system today, it will be a nightmare diagnosing uh, these different uh, heat pump systems. We're looking at six to seven different valves that can switch directions, that can open, um, that can close. And if you don't know exactly what the temperature should be where, you are having some serious issues uh, with this. And you have to remember, inside the dashboard, we used to just have an evaporator. Now we have an internal condenser as well, and we're talking... Uh, we're talking parallel flow microtube technology, meaning that once you reverse a flow, let's say that you have some particles of dirt in your system and you reverse the flow, that means that suddenly the dirt you just had going through the condenser, the normal condenser, now it's going through the internal condenser. So you're not just destroying the first one, you're also destroying the second one. Uh, this can easily become a nightmare uh, for someone who who's not very very particular about these systems. I see. Yeah. So this is definitely introducing some uh, d- deep complexities in our in our world. And um, you know, the, some folks in the in in our country here may not see these vehicles on a regular basis, but it is the future, no. right? We're going to see a lot more electrified uh, yeah. vehicles, and not only is it driver comfort, but it is the essential uh, operation for thermal management of the battery, power, electronics, and so on. So um, better sharpen your skill set, exactly. right? 
Oh yes, you're right. I mean, and that's why we offer that. That's why we offer the training classes. Uh, our training class is very generic. It's it's got nothing to do with us telling you about the business products or anything else. It's simply about understanding the system. So everybody has the opportunity to actually learn how this works and how they should proceed once they get, once they're. Those vehicles some comes into your workshop, so you don't have to give it away to someone else. I mean, we, we basically want the cars to be in your workshop, and you 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 feel fairly familiar with the with the system once it comes in. Um, we, we do this on a regular basis simply because we want to give it back to the industry and say, listen, I mean, this is what you can get. I mean, if you want to do it, here you go, and you can use as much as you want to. Uh, and then those training players are available. So, oh. so yes, definitely. Great. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure our listeners are, appreciate uh, companies out there that support uh, the, the workforce and, and help us be more proficient so that we can uh, address these concerns sure. and get these vehicles fixed. So where do folks go for more information about the training that uh, is offered through, through Nissan's? Well, the, the the best thing would actually be to 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 actually send an email directly to me because I can redirect you. I can redirect them to to what we call the NTC and the Nissan training concept. Uh, that's a training concept that we have where information is available for training. It's not a commercial uh, website. It's actually a dedicated training website. Uh, so the best thing would actually go to to write to my email min at nissan dot com. Uh, I hope you can display it later, so it's it's a little bit easier to to, to read it. So so basically, if 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 you have to go through that, I can direct you, and that that's a lot easier. You could go to listens dot com, but then you have to go different layers and click into the NTC universe. Uh, we do have an office in in Dallas, Texas, that you can write to, uh, but I can redirect it specifically to who you need to talk to. Uh, and since I'm in charge of the training program worldwide, it would be easier to write to me, uh, and I will direct you and, and make sure that you can get into that, the, what we call the NTC universe. Okay. And it's a universe where it's, it's free of charge training, uh, training classes, uh, uh, YouTube links and everything else to all the training classes we've done. We recorded that some self learning online training classes and so forth. So okay. uh, that's readily, readily available. Excellent. And then, uh, so when COVID, or when we, when I, when the world moves past uh, COVID, uh, I take it you do, uh, or your company offers uh, instructor-led training uh, courses here as well yeah, in we the do. states. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, we um, do. We actually we will we'll be present at the Apex show as well. So if anybody wants to come see us, we have a booth. Uh, we've done that for the past twenty years. So so we're there. But yeah, yeah, we do do physical training class as soon as COVID nineteen. Is hopefully over or, or under control. Let's put it that way. Uh, we will resume those training classes. Yes, we will. Sure, great. Well, thank you for that very much. Uh, and so, one closing thing uh, I want to add in here is that I noticed that uh, you were also uh, in charge of another organization um, in supporting um, air conditioning uh, efforts. Uh, what can you tell me about that? That's true. We well, I'm I'm the president of what's called Mac Partners. Mac Partners is the basically a, the equivalent of Max uh, in your uh, Max in the U.S. We are Mac Partners in Europe. We basically do the same thing. We we are well, but but we are non-profit organization, meaning that that Nissan Automotive supports this organization uh, by delivering my basically work free of charge. That means that we politically try to impact the EU to make more control when it comes to trainings, more certificates, making sure that people actually do get the training they need to be able to perform the service they need on heat pump systems, AC systems, uh, and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, in Europe, uh, and, and you basically have the same thing. You have different states, we have different countries. Uh, in different countries that legislation, we have a European-based uh, certification that's Unfortunately, it's very vague. So what we are trying to do is we're trying to introduce the the certification program that you guys also have, uh, where the EPA is also involved. Uh, I'm also actually talking to the EPA in the U.S. to try to uh, get them to influence the EU so we can get some of your uh, training programs into into the EU. So so that's what we're fighting for, basically. Uh, so we're a nonprofit organization that basically wants to make sure that everybody has the right certification once they need to work on the air conditioning system on vehicles. 
Okay. So anybody that's in Europe that's uh, interested in, in joining the efforts for that, uh, that group, where do they go? Well, they actually, they, they go to the Mac Potter's website uh, and, and they simply just sign up or they simply just write to me. Okay. Uh, normally what happens is that people become aware of my partners, they write directly to me because I'm the president, and then I make sure they get enrolled in the system, and, and anybody can be a member. I mean, I'm, I'm the member of Max, uh, and a lot of my European colleagues are also for, uh, members of Max. So if you're American, if you're Australian, or in Australia, it's Vasa, uh, but if you're, any, any, if you're anybody, you can actually sign up for Mac Partners. What you're going to get, and we're reshaping everything these days, but what you're going to get, you're going to get uh, newsletters of vehicles, what's happening, what's not happening, uh, what should be happening, uh, basically from a European perspective, not from an American perspective. But some, some people do like that, that perspective, and if you only work in European vehicles, uh, there's a lot of technical bulletins that we can get. You can get technical uh, support from us if you want to. Uh, so, so that's basically how this works. So basically, you write to me, and that, that's the easiest way to sign up, and I'll, I'll get it done. We are actually right now making a brand new website where you can sign up online and everything else, so everything's just working automatically. But we, we've had to reshape Mac Partners simply because we, it was, uh, I became the president last year, and it was in the state where we had to change some things. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. I, I can tell you that uh, being proactive and, and helping organizations like uh, yourself or Max um, definitely can have uh, benefits on the other end of it, right? Um, because there's a lot of things changing quickly. And, and uh, without these uh, legislators or policymakers having a real good understanding of what the heck's going on, uh, you know, in the, in the service base, uh, they're going to end up making, making mistakes sometimes. Right. Uh, so I appreciate everything that you guys are doing for us. Okay. Sure. No, you're welcome. I mean, we, we have to do it. And, and honestly, from a Nissan's automotive perspective, we, we have to give something back and, and, and nonprofit organizations are very, very important because honestly, we can't pay for everything. So we, we basically just have to do this and make sure that thing is right. And, and to me, I think it's great if you go to Nissan's automotive training class. But honestly, I want you to take as many training classes as you want to, and I want the training class to be as high as level as you can. I mean, I, I, I have, I, I, of course, we have competitors, but I, honestly, nobody can train everybody. So the point is that people get training. I think that's the important thing. And the trainings has a certain level. So everybody knows, okay, I did a distance automotive training class level one. Uh, now I can do a, let's say, a Mahler in Europe, a Mahler training class two, and then, okay, uh, and then I'd go back to this and train cat three. So, so we don't try to, 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 to take too much time out of your busy schedule. The problem is there's so many training cars out there that you guys probably don't even know these days which one should I go to and which one should not, which one is good and which one is bad. So if we actually make sure to separate these training classes and make sure and say, okay, this is level one, this is level two, this is level three, you guys know exactly what to expect when you go into a training class. Uh, yeah, so so uh, I hope we can get to that point. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, training is, uh, is is essential. You know, knowledge is power. And by the way, the three courses that you delivered for Worldpack that I was able to watch, uh, those are all recorded and they're available on the Worldpack uh, training website. And I, I will leave those also in the show notes for our listeners. Uh, they can go consume that, uh, that content. I, I highly recommend it. It's uh, awesome information. So, hey, thanks again, Michael. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and, and insight. And hopefully uh, we'll get Get you back on the show at some time in the future. We can go deeper on maybe some of these other uh, the pressing issues uh, surrounding uh, uh, HVAC uh, issues. Thank you. Sure, that, that would be great. I mean, anytime you guys have have any chance of, of, of inviting me, I'll, I'll be welcome to join you, even though it's in the middle of the night. Hey, I'm, I'm game. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. All right, next up, we have a NASDAQ update. All right, we've got Donnie Cipher, the executive officer of NASDAQ, on the call today. Welcome, Donnie. 
Hi, Scott. Good hey. to see you. Hey, good to see you and hear from you, right? So, yeah. you know, we've got uh, a lot going on, um, and I wanted to catch up with you to, to get our listeners some insight into what's happening with NASDAQ. Uh, we just, uh, you know, we would normally have had our spring meeting, which was scheduled to be held, in, I think, sometime in May, right? It was going to be in San Diego with uh, the ETI meeting. Yeah, it was supposed to be Cinco de Mayo in San Diego, and that would have been a lot of fun. Yeah, but unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, like everything else, uh, we're, everything's getting canceled or postponed or what have you. So we had a virtual meeting, uh, general meeting, that was uh, on June 6th. Uh, and so let's maybe let's just run through a little recap for those that uh, didn't get a chance to attend that. Um, so what, what were some of the highlights there? Well, I think the biggest highlight was the sheer number of technicians who came to that call and participated in that call. Because one of the things that's always kind of, I don't know, bugged me, if you will, was that, you know, when we have our industry meetings, uh, these guys are turning a wrench. They're working day to day, and it's hard for them to take two or three days off and, you know, come to where we held our meetings and that sort of thing. So, um, I think the takeaway from this for NASDAQ, for both Holly and I, was we will definitely continue to do a general meeting online. And uh, as it's shaping up for Apex, uh, because the automakers are, are still not going to be able to travel, it's looking like, we're going to do our general meeting online um, either around, probably around Apex, because I don't think we want to I don't think we want to interfere with that for the folks that do go. But I was really happy. I think we had a it's either 168 or 178 participate in that, and um, that was really great. We also did it after work for um, all but you know you guys on the on the West Coast. Um, so we, we you know we effectively started at I think five o'clock your time, but we were. We were later for everybody else, and that, I think that was really great. So that's my that's my first piece of this meeting that that was really great from our point of view. Yeah, and I think that uh, you know that that is profound because you know I've been to pretty much every general meeting in the last uh, you know decade or so, and yeah, lack of technician attendance, and and that's you know understood. I mean, usually the events are not really something that a tech can afford to take off and, and come and travel to. You know, we've had a ha small handful, but, you know, the accessibility and convenience uh, certainly uh, proved to be a, a positive point here because uh, we, we drew a, a pretty big crowd, and I'm happy to hear that uh, we want to continue that uh, effort, too, to, to gain some exposure and uh, share with, uh, with the industry what NASTEF is doing. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, and you know, the, the, the events that we do, when we do them at Apex, we get a real opportunity to mix the folks who are not maybe technicians, but are helping technicians, both aftermarket and automaker. And so those are important meetings, as is the ETI meeting that we participate in, because we get the tool guys in force at that meeting and we get the automaker tool guys. So really there's opportunities for those parts of NASDAQ's mission to really get served. And so that's great. But, but I think it doesn't, it's no big drama for us to do these three different types of meetings and really make sure that our, if you will, our end user, our collective customer as automakers and aftermarket associations is the technician. So that, I'm, I'm really uh, happy that we're going to continue to do more of that. Yeah, and I think the technicians appreciate the, the opportunity to actually hear directly from uh, representatives from the OEMs and and actually have the opportunity to, to direct questions right to them and uh, and get a response. So I think that's pretty uh, pretty profound. Yes, and we'll rewrite the way we do it to better facilitate that as well. You know, we can do the dog and pony show of, you know, NASDAQ's numbers and finances and all that stuff that really don't matter to anybody but the board. Um, we can do all of that at those meetings, but then the ones that we do for the technicians, um, there was no question that that one of the highlights uh, was one of the things you want to talk about, and that was Bob Stewart being on and talking. 
Yeah, so Bob Stewart is from GM, and uh, he's a longtime board member and uh, an ally, and uh, he takes it right to GM. He he he's a great conduit because he understands what's uh, you know what's happening in the marketplace. So yeah, recap uh, for us what he had to share. Well, so the, uh, a couple of uh, key takeaways is that General Motors um, really does get how technicians work. They consider the aftermarket a partner in maintaining our collective customers' vehicles. They see that as um, part of their success story. And they also have really embraced this concept that I run around talking about all the time. Well, before I even started saying it, I just you know turned it into a catchphrase. But make it easy for the good guys and make it hard for the bad guys. And so they go to a lot of lengths to do cybersecurity, and oftentimes that frustrates technicians. But what they really have done a great job with is say, okay, in the service department, how's this going to work? And they, they engage their dealers, and then their dealers come back and say, there is no way we're going to do it that way. They listen, and, and they, then they also engage us. And so that's really been a good opportunity to have that discussion, but also, for example, we, we wanted to talk about gateways, and, and that and that came up on the call. And um, one of the big things that GM does that's a little different than everybody else is they will never have a gateway. Um, their diagnostic port will not have a gatekeeper. Their modules are what they and I put in quotes are hardened, so their modules handle the security aspects at a module-to-module level. So, you know, you could have all kinds of mayhem running around on their network, but the way they uh, they manage it is that module protects itself. So that makes it so that scan tool work is easier to do both from the original tool as well as in the aftermarket. So it's one of their things. And um, they, they also are, are really trying to make it so that the things that they do are transparent, um, so that the end user themselves isn't even aware that they're being protected. And to some degree, I have a great appreciation for that. That's really awesome, and I'm glad they do that. But I also think that all of us that are connecting ourselves to cars and diagnosing and repairing them, we need to take responsibility for those things and not just expect the manufacturer to always get it right and always do everything for us. Yeah, that uh, I, I think the the most profound thing that he he said, uh, Bob Stewart said, is that uh, we we do not want to create a negative experience, right? He he said that uh, there should be no difference in the interfacing with the the vehicle. Um, regardless of what scan tool you're using, it, it's going to authenticate or it's going to basically, you know, go into the module uh, securely and um, and get the job done. So it's not really having an adverse effect that say, you know, some of the other manufacturers have taken a position of creating a a gateway and then now authenticating into that. Um, so so I can appreciate that. Yeah, no, no doubt. That was that was a really great takeaway from that discussion, and and of course the GM has been great partners to NASDAQ, and um, I think that they take the least aggressive approach that will get it done. Um, although sometimes from the optic of being the technician working on the car, you're like, well, why are they doing it that way? And there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that. I think are the reasons, and, and they don't come out and say, "Well, we're doing it because of this." They just say, "This is this is how we have to do it now." Yeah, GM is pretty good. I, I you know, I just recalled a, a recent experience we had here in the shop. I had a customer bring in a uh, a pretty fancy Corvette. Uh, C, it was a C7. It was a special edition or whatever. But this guy was a real enthusiast, and he knew he had there was some update that had to do with the suspension, the automated, you know, the, the active suspension. And uh, he asked if I could update it. And I said, sure, yeah, I can do it. So he left the car and I went to go through and there were a number of modules that needed to be updated. But what I found is that I, the file wasn't available uh, when I went to do the, the update. And so I, I called, I put in a request 
uh, tech support request. A guy called me within like 10 minutes. We were on the call. We were talking. He goes, okay. I explained to him what was going on. I couldn't find this uh, this file. It says not available. He says, okay. Um, oh, okay. I see the problem. Uh, I'm going to make the change right now. Wait five minutes and then uh, back out of the tool and go back into it, and it should be there. And sure enough, it was 10 minutes later, I went back to, you know, to, to go in there, and everything was there, and I'm going, oh, my gosh. Can you believe that I just called General Motors and they, you know, they couldn't have, they didn't have this file for this car, and ten minutes later I'm able to execute and actually carry on my my work. So that that, that to me seemed pretty profound, you know, being in the aftermarket. I'm sure that happens a lot, you know, in the dealer environment, but you know, that's an aftermarket. Uh, that's a testament to the fact that GM is working with the aftermarket. Well, yeah, and just to take that one for a step further, about two years ago. AC Delco, who is the support um, component that you dealt with there, they were posed with, you either have to cut back on your the number of support people you have, or you've got to raise your prices because we haven't raised our prices in 10 years and, and, the, and the money loss is now too much. We'll, we'll put up with you breaking even or losing a little bit of money, but you're losing too much. And the approach that that department took uh, Bob's boss and, and that team, they said, no, we will not compromise our support for the aftermarket. Instead, let's revise some of this stuff to make it make better sense for the majority of our customers. And of course, our mobile and, and uh, mobile diagnostic guys weren't happy with it. But at the end of the day, what they did was they raised a little bit more money back into that program and f- with the folks that use it all the time, as opposed to that money being spent by people who don't use it all the time. So it really becomes a use-based kind of program. And, and uh, I think that was a really great call. And, and it, like you say, the, the response time is stellar. I mean, they, they and several of the other automakers really do a fantastic job of getting back to us. Yeah, that's uh, that is good. So, um, so moving forward here, uh, you know, a couple of the other things I wanted to bring up here. You know, we've had recently something that's happened with uh, FCA, who now is going to have a new name, I hear, um, which I can't even pronounce at the moment. But um, they recently made some changes or, or started making an announcement on making some changes to their uh, their reprogramming function, um, which you know it's raised a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, raise some eyebrows, I guess, or, or you know, really, f- uh, you know, cause some, some pain for some folks. But, you know, nevertheless, when we talk about costs, right, uh, it does cost to do this stuff and to maintain. And then you've got, uh, you know, these are all web-based tools and the web tools continue to evolve and change, you know, driven by security protocols all the way through, right, for all the way from one server to the to the end user. And a lot of, a lot of that stuff's not really visible to people. And, uh, you know, understanding where they're at, and they, they looked at their business, uh, you know, and their their business units and where they were spending money and maybe how much money they need to make in, in, on the investment side for growth and, and uh, you know, expansion. Um, they made a few changes. And so let's, let's just walk through those changes a little bit. Sure. Um, Fundamentally, and and I don't have all the details because it was kind of still evolving, but fundamentally they went to a VIN-based reflash, which you used to be able to get a Tech Authority subscription and and flash a vehicle while you had that. Well, they went to a VIN-based reflash like General Motors. Now, the reason for that wasn't so they could make more money. Actually, they've had... Um, and I'm sure they wouldn't mind me saying this, they've had a million and a half dollar loss in the key code piece of their business since NASDAQ went online with SDRM2. And, and there's a number of reasons for that, but there's also a couple of reasons we, we just don't know. We have no idea how that number of codes that were being bought are now not being purchased and that they are actually... Um, not needed. You know, there, it's a supply and demand thing, right? There's a demand for fix my car because the key is missing, and there's the supply. Well, the supply suddenly drops in its volume by almost half, 
and and we know we were we're enforcing that now so that's that's what caused it because you can directly tie it to that but where are all these people who can't get their cars fixed that's the one i just don't have an answer for but on the other side of it that was how they were funding a lot of their service information requirements but the real driver was not as much money as it was that there was an extremely large number of misuses and sharing of those tech authority uh, subscriptions, which would result in one technician sharing with three other technicians on the same day um, that are you know networking together. They were sharing that subscription. And FCA said, well, that's not fair. Well, of course, we agree with them. It's not fair. You're, you're, you're saying when you take the license from them that you'll use it at your shop. And um, that wasn't what was happening. So that's what drove them to do the VIN-based. But then it also brings something similar to the table like with General Motors where now you can flash that vehicle for no additional cost for an extended period of time. So should there be a module that fails? You don't have to pay for a subscription again. So if you're having to warranty this, you don't have to warranty that and lose money on that again. So they really did look at the model from the typical repair shop. They did not look at it, again, from the mobile diagnostician side of it. And, and that's something we continue to, and I, and I talked about this on the, on, at the general meeting, we continue to try to make them more aware of how that business, business model works. But at, at one point, they were all very... Uh, most of the automakers were very oppositional to that because, unfortunately, that's where a lot of this sharing was coming from. And so they were pigeonholing all of these guys because they didn't have optics into it. So, you know, that's where we've got several um, that do this and, and are very good at it. And whenever there's a question, I reach out to one of them and say, can you talk to this automaker, explain the business model to them, help them understand. Because when they're trying to write end user license agreements, you guys get a muck with them because you're actually out doing contracting work for other shops and collision shops and that sort of thing. And, and believe me, I've had more than a few phone calls from very upset vendors who get out there and try to do it and then get a cease and desist letter. So I think we've got those companies understand now that we're, that we're involved in that, but they're also having to adjust their business models. And so it's a work in progress, as this always is as technology comes down the road. Yeah, so uh, let me go back to the... I'm, I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around the, the $1.5 million loss um, in key code. This was in key code revenue? Okay, and so that was since going to SDRM two. So what what blocker? What what, what did uh, we shut off? Well, in effect, we had a number of key code brokering companies that were using SDRM to access and then sell codes, and so they would go in and just buy them off the website. Well, SDRM two has got some artificial intelligence and some human intelligence that's very good at what they do. And so we learned how to identify those folks, and then we taught our dog how to do that trick, too. So SDRM actually has got a routine in it to look for these types of misuses. And so one of the big, big sources for that was FCA. Um, So now that that door is closed, a huge revenue drop. But here's the secondary revenue drop that they're all trying to wrap their head around is that a lot of these um, key code companies that sell codes outside of the, the registry, they have figured out the algorithms that were used by some of these automakers to generate their key codes to begin with. And so, in effect, they've implemented that into a scan tool, and now all the security that was intended to be on the vehicle is gone. Oh, interesting. So your okay. Owner, your car is no longer protected because anybody can walk up plug into a car, circumvent its security, and drive it off. Hmm. Okay. So we've got some legacy effect um, due to the fact that, uh, you know, going way, way, way back when, you know, original architecture, vehicle architectures were being built, um, they didn't think that security was such a big deal. 
and uh, and now here we are. They we're just suffering. Have alarm, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like beep, beep, beep. Someone's trying to steal me, and now it's much more sophisticated. Yeah. All right, good. That's uh, that's some really good insight there. I, I think a lot of people don't quite understand how all of this stuff works and uh, what kind of a dance is going on out there. That's uh, absolutely amazing. So you know, thanks for the uh, thanks for the insight on that. Yeah, I will just say, Scott, it's tricky. Every day, you've got to balance how do you make it easy for the good guys against how do you make it hard for the bad guys. And you also have to balance an automaker that's under pressure from somebody that isn't even in the Department of Technology, who's just looking at actuarials and risk and all of that, who's saying, shut that thing down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to talk them out of the tree in some cases. Fortunately, the automakers that are involved with SDRM they come to meetings now. I mean, we have big turnout. I just had a meeting with them two days ago um, to talk about the theft that's actually not happening out of SDRM, but it's happening out of dealerships. And they they got their head around it. They embraced it. They're making policy changes. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it, not all of the folks that repair cars are going to be happy about that. But they need to understand that there's a much bigger picture. And quite frankly, if we do our job well, and I tell the board this, if we do our job well here, you'll never hear that we did it. Because if, if, we, if you have to hear about it, something went wrong first. Yeah, so is the, uh, I, I guess, well, I guess, um, I, I don't want to say I guess. The uh, So the OEMs, they could perhaps be or start using SDRM to transact that those key codes to eliminate that that uh, leak that they've got it is an open opportunity we've presented it to them if they choose to do it we're happy to support them um, we've also suggested that many of them have got policies that would be fine if they were being implemented and enforced mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so now that we're talking more about security uh, and SDRM, uh, one of the uh, questions that did come up in the in the call from the group, and one that I actually experienced myself, is um, you know with Ford uh, to do so to do a Ford uh, collision radar or adaptive cruise control radar calibration on a late model Ford, you now have to um, you have to unlock that or go through um, a secure gateway. And you're basically just entering in your NASDAQ uh, credentials, if you're an SDRM uh, holder, uh, to open that up. So why is that, uh, why is that now happening? Well, Ford has had... Um, when, when you have key operations for, for several years, they've had the vehicle security professional ID be the gatekeeper to being able to put keys in and take them out. You know, back in the day, IDS, which is, you know, Ford scan tool for those who don't do Fords, um, IDS would get, make you wait 10 minutes to do it. Um, but then Ford decided that wasn't really all that secure. Um, and so they went to this technique of saying, okay, we want, we want that to go through the SDRM because then we know that whoever's getting the car has been vetted. And, you know, if they're doing security things, it's going to be a lot harder for it to be a thief. So the problem they ran into when they started facilitating the calibration operations was we think we got it under control when we're in, in a dealership, but what do we do if just somebody gets hold of our scan tool? This has always been an issue we've talked about. You know, making the scan tool the security device, well, that's great until someone steals the scan tool, right? So what do we do when, how do we make sure the person that's actually working on that car is authenticated to work on that car? That, that we know who they are after the fact and we know who they are the moment they want to get in. Well, so they decided, well, let's use the, the VSP registry to do that. And so the reason that they did that was because, unfortunately, the way that their network architecture is, they've got to open up a whole lot of stuff to be able to do that calibration because multiple modules, you know, you're, you're the teacher, multiple modules are um, being accessed and, um, you know, talking back and forth to, to facilitate that. And if you were in, in a calibration mode, you definitely could hack a Ford. Mm-hmm. Okay, understood. So that's why. 
Okay. Interestingly enough, I got a call from a scan tool company, an aftermarket scan tool company, who just asked if they could do the same thing. They want to put security operations in their scan tool, and they're concerned that with some of the capabilities they have, their tool could be used to do bad things. And they said, could we do, could we do this with you know, our tool, can we do the same thing the automakers do? And I'm like, of course. We'll set the scan tool company up with their own code, just like an automaker has, and they'll be able to do the same things. Again, some techs are not going to like it, but the reality is it's a world we have to secure these days. We can't just assume people are all honest. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's a pretty honorable uh, position for that scan tool company to come come out and uh, be concerned about about that. That's uh, that's a good good feeling. So, so yeah, thanks for that information. So, what's next for uh, Nastef? What's what's coming down the pike? Well, we've got you know we keep talking about it. This website project we did is is taking on a life of its own, but it's um, all components of it are going to be such a drastic improvement that I just keep being patient as our team works on development and um, it's getting closer and closer and we're testing it and making sure it works great. So that, that, that will happen. Um, the service information platform I'm very excited about because it's going to go from, it's kind of morphing from just being a complaint department to also being a crowdsourced way for our members to share and solve problems. And, and, and there's lots of forums out there, so we're not trying to take anything from the forums. What we're trying to do is facilitate how does an automaker and an aftermarket scan tool maker and, an, and a technician, how can they talk to each other? And how does that, because a lot of legal teams don't want their folks involved in that. But through NASDAQ, they're, they're, that's relaxed. They're saying, because the forum's going to be moderated, because it's going to be expected that everyone will be ladies and gentlemen with each other, um, that will be a, that'll be a means for these communications to happen. So what I expect to have happen, my, my expected outcome from this is communications when there's a problem shouldn't reach that level of service information request that the, oh, my God, I can't figure this out as often. It'll be more likely to say, you know, I was playing with this the other day and you guys have this new thing. And uh, is that going to work with X fill in the blank? And this would be an opportunity for an automaker to comment on that as they wish, or at least to provide, <clears throat> pardon me, a response to NASDAQ that we can post for them, however that may be. But I think probably last year's statistics were Roughly 40% of the SIRs that came in were not SIRs. They were not a legitimate uh, unavailability of information, scan tool problem, training information. They were just a tech looking for an answer for something that he didn't know. Well, you know, I hate turning those away, but at the same time, I mean, yeah, I work nonstop. So to answer all of those is just overwhelming. So why not put it out to this amazingly smart community we have? And, and let them help. So that's what we're going to do also with the SIR. Um, we'll moderate them. If somebody puts in one and says it's a service information request, we'll have all the information. And if we say, you know, it's not a service information request, but let's put it out and see if other people have had a similar problem. So the scenario I've been giving people is, let's say you've got this particular laptop, this particular J2534 box, and you're using a, a an automaker piece of software or an aftermarket piece of software and something doesn't work right, an automaker is going to say, well, we don't vet those. How would we know? But on the other hand, some other member of our enormous database is going to say, oh, yeah, I've been down that road. I do this and I did this and you need to make this little registry edit and it looks like that. So we're going to even be able to host screen caps and all of those sorts of things that we can't do with our existing system to allow our members to share in much more granular detail things that help them. Of course, we're not going to share trade secrets or anything like that. This is just intended to make you know, that repair thing um, faster and to uh, supplement all of the great forums that are already out there, but also allow some people who don't participate in them and can't participate 
to uh, to be able to play in that space too. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And I, and you know that one guy that has a question, you know, other people are going to have that same type question. So, yeah, this uh, this will be pretty pretty profound. I think that uh, you know not only will we be raising the situational awareness for the, the technicians in the workforce, but uh, like you said, the the OEMs now can have some visibility. You know, not so much just waiting for an SIR, but maybe start they see some dialogue around hey certain things are now happening and hey how can we get in front of this or how can we leverage or help the uh, help the the community the the professional technicians out there um, help us get get the solutions out there so this will be uh, this will be great and it'll then you know it'll grow into a um, a resource right it'll be a an information resource um, you know because in this modern day we've got access to service information but then there's also aftermarket service service information and there's access to other bits of information and uh, you've got to be a, a pretty uh, a pretty good resource uh, gatherer um, to succeed in this industry and it's not going to get easier so this definitely will help uh, help technicians and uh, help the industry move forward so thank you all right, Donnie. Well, thanks for, for taking time here in your busy day to uh, sit down with me for a few minutes and uh, update our listeners with uh, everything that's going on with NASDAQ. How can people learn more about NASDAQ or join? You can go to um, nasdaq.org. And of course, this is our dusty old version, and uh, but it still works fine to join. And uh, you can go to, to uh, nastf.org. You can click on the join for free and you can join us um there are no dues unless you want to become a vsp to be a uh, to be a member of nastaf and um when the new version comes out you'll be able to customize the whole experience to the brands you're interested in and the issues that nastaf works on that you're interested in um but in the meantime you can join and when we migrate that database you'll be ready to go with the new one yeah, so if they want to join the uh, VSP or the Vehicle Security Professional, um, th- those links are right there on the NASDAQ page. And, uh, you know, it is, a, it is a process, but, uh, you know, if you're in the aftermarket and you're servicing uh, modern vehicles, you probably better get, get equipped. Uh, I know that we, we got our license um, a few years ago, and, uh, you know, we don't get a lot of use out of it, but we just had some TRP parts that we had to purchase, and the, the whole process went pretty smooth and i'm thinking wow this is awesome i'm glad i had the uh, i'm had, glad i had this credential in place uh because now i was able to to you know take care of the customer and get them down the road all right donnie well thanks again uh, i'm sure we'll catch up uh, again we'll get you on the uh, on the torque factor in the future and uh i appreciate all your uh, hard work it's my pleasure thank you Well, normally we would have a list of events to announce, but instead, and unfortunately due to COVID, a lot of those events have been postponed. However, ASA Northwest is hosting a virtual automotive training expo on August 3rd through the 6th. More information can be found at atetrainingexpo.com. Hello, Newman. And we'd love to field some of your questions, so please consider emailing us, podcasts at vehicleservicepros.com. Now that brings us to the end of the show, and we hope we're able to bring you some quality content and look forward to future episodes. And we're looking for your feedback, so if you have any questions or comments, please drop them in the mailbag. And please hit the subscribe button to receive notifications on future episodes. Thanks for joining us.